This is the Criterion Creeps podcast, and tonight we're talking about Pick Up on South Street from 1953, directed by Samuel Fuller. And tonight we're joined by Patreon Creep host, co-host, Sam Sanchez. Thanks, Sam. And the tagline for this film, gentlemen, how the law took a chance on a B-girl and won. What? (laughs) Is that really the tagline? Yeah, I didn't. On a B girl, I I did not read this beforehand, and I'm confused now. I, is it because uh, uh, she's like a B actress, uh, Jean but Peters? Even Jean Peters, she's not at like this even time one of the more popular. <laughs> like she's B actresses that I would even have heard of. That, that's that's what they, that's what they sold it for on, I guess, in 1953, I suppose. But man, she yeah, yeah like she's not really. <laughs> I guess she doesn't have much of a run beyond this either. Like the biggest thing would have been like Niagara, which came out the same year. Yeah, yeah exactly. Wait, is the tagline talking about the actress specifically or the character in the movie? I, th- I mean, I to me that references the actor in the thing. If they're talking about Thelma Ritter, then I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I love Thelma Ritter. It's like the horse's mouth, smart Alec, all Guinness. Exactly. And you're like, you're like what? What does that mean? Oh, it's that, funny. That, it's, that means nothing. Well, it's funny you mentioned that, RJ. We'll we'll get to that though at the end. Okay. In New York City, an insolent pickpocket, Skip McCoy, mm. inadvertently sets off a chain of events when he targets ex-prostitute Candy and steals her wallet, unaware that she has been making deliveries of highly classified information to the communists. Candy, who has been trailed by FBI agents for months in hopes of nabbing the spy ringleader, is sent by her ex-boyfriend joey to find skip and retrieve the valuable microfilm he now holds so uh this is a movie that i watched for the first time about three years ago in what i dubbed jan noir airy uh which Mm -hmm. is uh my excuse to just blast through you know the hundreds and hundreds of film noirs that were made in the 40s and 50s because there's a whole lot of them and uh, mm-hmm. I mean there's like the obvious ones that everybody knows about but there's so many and there's like always going to be like varying degrees of quality uh, amongst these films but there's usually something worthwhile uh, great character actors abound uh, interesting plots great cinematography all those sorts of things so in January I try to go through and make make a point of doing it didn't do a very good job this year but three years ago I was uh, hot on doing that and I, I, wa- I made a point of even watching Pick Up on South Street which I knew that I'd inevitably be watching for this podcast just because I, I heard it was mm. one of the best and uh, well we'll get there mm-hmm. so um, but maybe not maybe I'll just say it I think this is a great movie um, <laughs> I think this is actually one of Sam Fuller's better movies uh, on the whole that I've seen uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, yeah so rewatching this movie I was actually struck by how really well made this movie was. Um, Mm -hmm. But actually, you know what? Maybe I should throw it to you two. Uh, Have either of you seen this movie before this week? RJ? Uh, No. (laughs) As as per usual. (laughs) That's that's why I'm here, right? So no, what about you, Sam? So yeah, I have. Um, So obviously I picked to be on this show. This is one of my favorite movies of all time. Similar to Long Goodbye, Pick Up on South Street might actually be in my top 10 as well. Easily top 100. And mm. plugging the list I have on Letterboxd, but I have like my top 100 film noir of like the classic era. Yeah. And Pick Up on South Street is my favorite film noir. Um, I've seen it probably like the very, for the very first time um, was probably back yeah when I was first getting into Criterion. It was probably one of the first that I went into that wasn't horror. And oh wow, um, it's just a very lightning fast 80 minute movie. Oh. And I remember, I, I remember liking <laughs> it at the time. Um, I think I know it's not popular with you guys, but I think I watched this along with Shot Corridor. Mm-hmm. I think initially mm-hmm. I liked Shot Corridor more, but each time I've watched Pick Up on Sastry, it just keeps growing and growing. Um, I'm not a big, if you guys, you can tell my letterbox, I don't rewatch a ton of movies or as, mm-hmm. as much as, as much as like probably like an average person does. Um, with this watch that I watched on, I think on Sunday, it's probably the fifth time I've watched it in the letterboxed era, which is a lot for me. That, yeah. <laughs> and then, and I probably watched it maybe three times prior. So I haven't watched it like, you know, there's people who watch their favorite movies 
hundreds of times or so. So eight is probably like eighty for an average person for me. It's um, it's pretty good. It's a pretty yeah. that's a that's a high number these days. Yeah, and, and each time I watch it, I just find more things here that I like, and it's like an eighty minute movie that feels like a forty minute movie. I I, I, mean. I can't like even like express how uh, excited and relieved I was when I went to see. Okay, what's the runtime on Pickup on South Street on the weekend? I went. Oh, 80 minutes like oh Mm -hmm. everything we watch it's always two hours it's always two hours why can't it be like this i like just purely on that i was like "Mm." so pleased Mm -hmm. so happy yeah and the movie itself it's not one of the ones that like when you think of film noir it's still even it when i think of like just quintessential film noir it's not the one that comes to mind first like big sleep the Big Heat, Asphalt Jungle, uh, those type of movies, like Double Indemnity, those come first as far as like when you think of film noir, you think those. But as far as something within that era, it's Pick Up on South Street's my favorite. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, um, yeah, I've I've had problems like trying to figure out what my like top noir movies would be. Like I always go through because I don't know, I feel like I'm maybe too picky on these things. But like usually for me, mm-hmm. um, if people check out Letterboxd, um, usually like four stars is a really good movie. Like, but it's mm-hmm. just like it, that kind of difference between a, that, that four to a five is just totally pure preference and like checking a ridiculous amount of boxes that just speak specifically to me. But four stars is like beyond like, it's like that. This is like an excellent example of this genre. And I think this movie has doesn't really miss a beat and i think it does so much really really well um but i guess like delving into what this movie's about beyond the the letterbox synopsis so this movie opens up it's like this like uh something that doesn't exist now in the uh, covid era where it's like jammed packed uh subway train cars uh where people are like touching like t- holding hands almost as they're holding on to the uh the little tassels on the hold or whatever it is on the bars above and uh we have these close ups of these characters and it's like, I don't know what it is, how he frames the stuff so well, but but you get like sucked into the story immediately. And like, I don't know, I watch a lot of different movies and it never works, but this, like I was totally engaged and like, you're kind of brought into this mystery because you have no idea what any of these characters want. They're just kind of like exchanging glances and you kind of tell like, um, that candy, like we have no idea what her story is. What is she doing on this train? Other than she's, she'd be going to work, going to meet somebody. You have no clue. Um, and then up comes big old sexy Richard Widmark with his newspaper. What? <laughs> and what did uh, you say? Sexy big okay. old Richard Widmark. You don't, you don't love his facial bone structure there, RJ? I mean, he's got good symmetry. Don't get me <laughs> yeah. wrong. He's but like, I just wanted him to repeat that. Okay. That's fine. You I, know? I, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine with that. So, sure, you're fine. <laughs> good. <laughs> um, anyway, so he rolls up on her. And we, we get like this explicit, like, I don't know. It's like, this is some uh, sexual tension. This is, feels very oh, yeah. risque. This man slides his fingers into her purse and he yeah. pr- pries it open and he slides in. And there's these shots of their eyes and her like looking up at him. I don't know if you guys have had uh, anyone look at you the way that mm-hmm. uh, she looks at Skip in that scene. But it's kind uh, of hard just looking at me throughout the throughout this. <laughs> Huh? <laughs> but touching on on that actually, it's probably not a great like. I would say as far as like if him being a pickpocket, like you probably right. shouldn't be making that much eye contact. <laughs> but I guess it does the job as far as like the sexual tension goes. Yeah. But nope. it, it probably wasn't a very effective move for him to do as being a pickpocket. Yeah. I mean, I have to. I, I I'll consult with my uh, Robert Bresson and see how uh, they pickpocketed. I guess. But yeah, I would mm-hmm. agree that maybe it's not the best technique. Hmm. Yeah, and she also like she does that thing. She kind of sticks her tongue out a little bit, <laughs> just like a little bit though. Just mm. and people get really close in this. Like later on, that he's reading the paper and it's touching the other guy's face, and you're kind of like, is that not too close, man? <laughs> Anyways, continue so, on talking about pick up on cell. So so Skip he snatches that uh, whatever it is, the little purse. He doesn't even know what it is, but he thinks he's got a nice little score, and he vambooshes all out of there. And of course, it's the, the cops are like, "Damn, that was the guy!" But they don't know what's going on. Skip doesn't know what's going on, and so things kind of get set in motion. We get the layout where uh, Candy was supposed to be involved in a handoff to something that she didn't understand for her her boyfriend Joey. 
this <laughs> this piece of shit. Oh man, what a what a like. You wonder like, what does he do for a living? Like, what is his job? He's such a coward, and then when he finally becomes not to, he decides not to become a coward, he just becomes more of a bigger piece of shit. Yeah. <laughs> My biggest problem was that his name was Joey. When you got <laughs> names like Skip, Dodge, Nails, Mo. Brewster, Mo. <laughs> Punks of Tony Phil, you got all these cool names, and then you got this guy just named Joey, and you're like, <laughs> "What is this, friends?" Elliot Gould's not in here as the dad of Monica and Ross. What's going on? <laughs> what is it, Jared? I Come on, know. I don't know. But yeah. Uh, so yeah, huh. th- th- so that's our that's our little bit of a tease, and then things start kind of uh, playing out as uh, the police are trying to identify who this pickpocket is. This person, because we don't know what has been actually stolen, but it's obviously not money. It's more valuable than money. Um, and things just kind of play. We introduce these wonderful uh, characters, uh, like Mo. Uh, oh, yes. Who uh, is, is sells ties, and uh, but she also deals with information. Uh, we get a great exchange of uh, paying off an informant, uh, about the cost of living going up, and uh, yeah, so eventually we get led to Skip, who lives on the docks. He lives in this like little, not a boathouse, but like at the end of the pier, uh, this little obscure place. He keeps his beers in this uh, wood box that he keeps on a rope. Uh, he's just that mm-hmm. kind of guy. He's a three-time loser. One more pinch, and he, it's for life for him, is the implication, I guess. Mm-hmm. But, he's, but he's seen it all. He's uh, he's dealt with all these cops doing their uh, tough guy acts and muscling him. He's not taking anything that they say, saying, oh, we saw you do it. Oh, sure you did. Um, <laughs> but like, it, it keeps escalating. So first the cops come at him. He blows him off. And then Candy comes at him. He blows her off too, but not before uh, knocking her out a little bit, you know. What do you mean? I don't know. He punches her out. <laughs> but he doesn't realize that it's a lady, I think. I think that's kind of because it's dark. He just socks her one. And then when he realizes it, he uh, checks her out. And then he like starts giving her a kick to the foot. Hey, <laughs> get up. <laughs> Do you think it would have changed things if he did know? Because after he hits her, he checks out her purse anyways, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, he still would have knocked her out if yeah. he knew it was a lady. I can't remember if at this point uh, I've already I missed think. the beat where uh, Candy goes and meets that, that guy at the Chinese food restaurant. Lightning Louie. Lightning Louie. <laughs> Fuck. That, uh, like, I, I that, for whatever reason, like, I totally forgot about that. I, I forgot about that, but then as soon as that scene popped up again, I'm like, oh, shit, yeah. This is what I love about noir is things like this. Because this guy, like, because you know he's disreputable because he eats Chinese food. That's it. Like it's all shorthand, mm-hmm. and he's, but he likes eating too much of it because he's fat and he's a bad guy. Like it's all mm-hmm. shorthand, and you're like, man, I want to see this movie. Like that's all I want my movies to be is populated with these types of people, but presented in a way where it's not like that John Wick stylization where everybody's got some sort of big massive story. It's like no, some guys just like sit around and eat Chinese food all day and like constantly like order more soup. I mm-hmm. love his character work too. Just like I don't know if it was his idea or Samuel Fuller, just like picking up the food with the chop- the money with the chopsticks, just putting him in his pocket with it. Yeah. It's just great. Yeah. And then like the whole little uh, what's my name? Uptown downtown or like <laughs> what's his downtown name? It's just so much like crammed into that guy that like, you have just more questions and it's just a great character. Yeah. Can we talk about the implications of picking up physical <laughs> paper money with chopsticks that then go into your mouth i know we're living in a post-corona world but even so it's not good right you guys wouldn't put money in your mouth would you i'm pretty bad with chopsticks so i doubt i would even be able to do that (laughs) myself Mm. i mean it's cool it looks fun but uh, i had serious serious problems with it because i was like this guy i I know he's not worried about germs especially letting lou is not worried about his health He's not worried. Uh, but, I mean, I do like – I mean, if I could be the guy who's just eating food and is going – just burping out, like, single words at a time and getting paid for it, why not? Why not? Why Richard? not? I'm trying to find uh, Lightning Louie's The Actor, but I'm not – I'm kind of – Where is he? I just called him Noodle Guy. I didn't re- – did they actually call him Lightning Louie in the movie or is that his yeah, credit? Um- She's she's looking for Lightning Louie. He, I guess, initially uh, doesn't tell her that he's Lightning Louie, and then he pays her mm. to find out who it is, and he says, I'm Lightning Louie, then he confirms with the waiter. Gotcha. To, to well, I, gotcha. I, I must have just missed his name. One, one downside, uh, I usually watch these movies with the subtitles just for the screenshot meme ability 
of these because on the Instagram, I put a lot of the scenes from it, but I couldn't get the subtitles for this movie uh, on my legal physical copy. I couldn't have the subtitles. So I was a little bummed out. And then uh, I, I miss things sometimes. You know what I mean? You know what I mean, guys? I, I feel miss yeah. things. I'm feeling yeah. Yeah. Jared, Jared knows what I mean. I so, always watch movies with subtitles. Always. Uh, I, uh, nice. Yeah. I, nice. Oh, so, okay, I just looked this up. So, B-Girl is a, it's a slang for a woman employee to talk to customers in a bar and encourage them to buy drinks. A hostess. Hmm. So, I, I the, law took a, the law took a chance on her and won. But it's like, uh, that's, is that the emphasis that the tagline would go with? It's just, again, baffling. Baffling to yeah. me. I think the cops are secondary to the story. Yeah, it's, it's a real, uh, it's a tale about... Uh, nationalism and and, and <laughs> capitalism and and the almighty buck, but not always because sometimes the almighty buck doesn't mean anything when in the face of the greatest threat of all collectivism. Love? <laughs> <laughs> because Dag Nabbit's those communists. So like I found it interesting. So this is 1953 when it's released, and it came out in June. And at, right at this exact time, I do believe the Rosenbergs are being either executed. For uh, also kind of s- selling uh, state secrets uh, for espionage. Let's see here. I was thinking, yeah, they they are hung like right when this movie came out, and I couldn't like help but like good think about press. Like, good press. I, I mean, but <laughs> it's uh, the the Wikipedia, which is usually this great beacon of truth and information, mm-hmm. doesn't mention mm-hmm. that connection at all. It has nothing to do with anything. They just happen to make this movie about. Russian spy networks and stealing plans for something, which is actually very um, uh, kiss me deadly ish because you never really know what the microfiche is. It's just like it's it's information that uh, America does not want the communists to have. Yeah, it's basically just a MacGuffin. Exactly. <laughs> and I assume. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, they just I was going to say that the the way they handle it too. It's the they handle it the, the like the whole communist thing. The way they handle it is very like the government or the not the government. The censors even thought it was it was being pro communist just because mm. the, the way the the way the characters were like Richard Woodbark did not care at all. Right, <laughs> like like he could care less, and even was basically accused like, "Are you waving the flag at me?" Like essentially just. <laughs> And then Samuel Fuller had to basically say, no, that's just his character. Like the, he's not, you know, the movie itself isn't pro, isn't pro communism. And even like Thelma Ritter, like she just knows she hates communism, uh, communists, but she doesn't know why. She just knows she mm-hmm. hates them. Yeah, they're no good. Yeah. <laughs> see, it seems like I see a lot of that in the news right now, especially uh, south of the border. Hey, Jarrett. Yeah. Where where Sam Sanchez lives, there's a, a lot of threat of communism coming up from America these days, and. Uh, I don't know who to trust. Let me tell you. Uh, so speaking of Wikipedia, I don't know if uh, either of you saw this little nugget of trivia. Um, we're talking about like the casting of Gene Peters. But uh, apparently, with only a week to go before the film started production, Sam Fuller saw Gene Peters walk into the studio's commissary, commissary while having lunch. Fuller noticed Peters walked with a slightly bow-leg style that many prostitutes also had. <laughs> Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. <laughs> what do they what does he mean many prostitutes were walking bow well, legged? I've that, seen my share and I've never seen a bow legged one. Well, I guess Gene Peters had that walk that he's like, Yeah, she can she can like, like I, I was like reading that I'm like, huh. Okay. i I've seen a lot of pigeon toed ones, but like that's a different story altogether, right, Jer? And, and webbed feet. Well, it's hard to tell from the from their Well their not gait, well, maybe but... during the summer. Um, I mean, it depends where they are. Like, are they closer to Wisconsin? Then probably, yeah. What does that mean? I don't know. Keep I don't. Going. I don't know. Uh, anyways, um, uh-huh. I'll, I'll hand it off to you, gents. I I think this movie is like pretty terrific. Uh, like the the some of the artisanal film craft is uh, fully on deploy here. Some great editing. Um, mm-hmm. At, at times, you know, obviously, it's also still a movie from 1953. The way that they would mm-hmm. shoot this now would have that far more of a missile But I found that, yeah, uh, yeah I know, right? <laughs> Disgusting, <laughs> horrible. But, uh, but, um, like, but, but the storytelling in here is like, like really great. And uh, again, w- w- I mean, maybe uh, Sam will talk about the use of light and dark, uh, <laughs> which is a hallmark of noir. Uh, I found it really great, like the claustrophobia of. Uh, of uh, Joey hiding out in the uh, dumb elevator. 
Mm-hmm. And like kind of the up down relationship yeah. stuff like that. I thought that was like really uh, that was some great stuff. And uh, later on, uh, we also have to go along with light and dark. We also have just good old brutality, <laughs> un- like surprising brutality, like man sliding face down downstairs. Um, oh. Or like yeah, when Joey uh, goes to town on Candy in the uh, in the hotel That's room. That's brutal. Oh <laughs> that yeah, scene is pretty brutal. Like she she's a trooper for for getting put, yeah. clearly getting put through all that. Yeah, he's tossing around. Apparently, like they had to re-edit that and like re shoot it a little bit too from uh something i read um but yeah i mean it still comes off as uh pretty pretty violent but uh what did you two chaps think of this experience and rj i know you haven't watched this movie at all but i don't know if you want to let sam go at it first i was going to let sam go at it i would just say like sam when you're not around that scene when he comes into her apartment that's usually what happens between me and Jarrett. um when you're not stay, a, having to stay six feet away when we're not six meters away, six meters, yeah. six meters, you got to specify because like you got to, you got to stay away from this guy. He's a bad dude. And so 18, uh, 18 he, feet might not be enough. 18 feet's probably not even enough, but uh, yeah, I just want to say that, but I would love to hear what uh, Sam has to say about this. Cause uh, it's been a long time coming. So what's up with pick up on South street, Sam? Cause I didn't even watch the movie. So you're going to have to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just, I love pretty much everything about the movie. Uh, like Thelma Ritter as Mo. She's just mm-hmm. one of my favorite, like, all-time characters. Like, she's so endearing. Like, everything about her, just like her, she's basically just selling ties, selling information, just to buy herself a grave plot, like, in a better, like, mm-hmm. uh, cemetery, just because she doesn't want to get buried at Potter's Field. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. What did she even say? Like, uh, it would just about kill me if, if I if she had to be buried there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just her final scene, too, like, where, like, where uh, Joey comes in and, Basically, what shoots her face off is what, what, what did they say? Shot, shot her face off is what they say later. That, yeah. Um, and that scene is, mm-hmm. I don't know, it, it actually does hit me. That, that <laughs> like zoom, than, like, that, that whole zoom in on her as she's delivering her, delivering that monologue. Yeah. And I, I love just like the feeling how like everyone, like, they, like you know, she's basically um, ratting everybody out, like just giving information, but everyone just understands. She just, she needs to live. Everyone needs to eat. Um, basically, like Skip McCoy, uh, find, Richard, he finds a tie in her purse. He, puts two and two together oh he got the information from yeah. mo and he's like oh well, she's got to eat. he's he's not he's not gonna hold it against her like even when they meet up later at the bar um mm-hmm. just like so many scenes that i love in this movie the, like i said like the movie itself it's short just very fast paced to me like every single time i watch it it's just very quick to watch um with um skip mccoy i, I just love richard woodmark in this as well um, it's probably my favorite role of his. Um, I don't know if you've seen like Kiss of Death. He plays a completely different character. He does a really good job, like in movies, like playing different characters. For the most part, he's very often not a great guy, but just different. Yeah. But just like I think I watched um, Hell in High Water recently by with Fuller. Uh, it's like a submarine movie with oh, Richard yeah, Woodmark. Yeah, as well. you, yeah, you kind of went on a uh, Fuller kick a little bit. Yeah, I was just watching because I, I went on a Fuller kick maybe like three or four years ago, and I was just kind of w- w- filling in like the gaps that i didn't finish that time um but yeah widmark and pretty much everything i've seen him and i I love him this might be my favorite character of his skip mccoy and just as a whole it's just a very easy watch um honestly i'm not going to go into i'm not big on like mise en scene (laughs) 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 as uh, rj kind of probably just winced with that um so i i just love the movie it's my i'd say top 10 easily uh favorite film noir of all time and a lot of it just has to do with just the characters the scene like so many great scenes like in a, in a movie um a lot of it what builds a movie in my memory is just like how many how many scenes stick with you afterwards like the opening scene that we've touched on already with the pickpocket the pickpocketing uh just the interrogations at the at the police at, at the investigation room there with the yeah. when they're interrogating mo um and you know she's selling the ties you know, she's concealing the information and then like, oh, I got like until she can get more money offered with the with Tiger. The I love the name Tiger for the mm-hmm. <laughs> for the police officer. I don't know if that's his actual name or just D- the Dan, name. Captain Dan Tiger. Oh, is that his actual name? I thought it was probably just named there for the joke where Skip McCoy says, like, what you feeding the tiger there? <laughs> so I wonder if they literally Fuller just wrote it in there just to be able to have that joke in there. Um but no, I, I love the movie. Um it's mm-hmm. been my my favorite criterion um pretty much since I watched it and I I've had the DVD for a while and then I've upgraded to, they haven't released this on Blu-ray, right? For no, Criterion? I think it, like, it's gotta be due though. Cause I did see that there is a new artwork 
on it uh, on the Criterion site. So maybe that's like a suggest that something's coming along. <laughs> Yeah, because it's not on the Criterion channel either, though, right? No, it's not. Yeah, well, it's on YouTube. Uh, so I'm not sure if it is, like, one of those movies that's, like, slipped into the public domain or something like it's that. It's weird, because yeah, I own the, mm. the way I watch it, I own the Masters of Cinema for, uh, Blu-ray from the Eureka. Oh, okay. mm. So I own that, but I've been kind of waiting to see. Well, I probably don't even have to double dip if, <laughs> if Criterion releases it, but yeah. just give me an excuse to buy it again and watch it again, probably. Yeah, if, yeah, if you look up on, yeah, on the Criterion site, they do have, like, a new cover uh, for oh, a pick okay. on Cell Street, which usually is a good sign that inevitably, I don't know if it's a great cover or anything like that, but uh, it looks very photoshoppy. But uh, yeah, I mean that's usually a good sign that they do. They will probably revisit it. They're doing, they're re-releasing everything on Blu-ray, and it seems like they put the DVD out once, and they st- and it's still in print, so that's encouraging. Totally. <laughs> what are your thoughts there, RJ? Uh, can you tell me about the lighting a little bit? <laughs> I, I I never I never winced. To, uh, I love lighting, man. Some of my uh, favorite parts of movies are the lighting. So, uh, in a completely genuine way, was there actually something you wanted to say about like specific, or you just think it's got good lighting? For me, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, it does good. It uses the lighting a lot, like pretty much as far as like other film noir movies and go. It's one of my favorite looking film noir movies. It doesn't. Mm-hmm. I won't say like it, as far as like you know the big key other those. Like the biggie has like the little shade, the use of the, sh- the lighting for the shades. It doesn't have yeah. any of those kind of scenes here. But right. the, uh, what I like the most about the movie is it doesn't really have to do with the lighting or anything. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's like uh, it's incredibly well shot for certain scenes too. And it's like I think the lighting's a big part of that also. Like some of my favorite shots were of uh, Skip's boathouse. Mm-hmm. So there's the the sky like the sky shot where it just kind of shows like a dude kind of coming up in a boat and you see the his little house and then there's a few shots later where he's coming back to his house and it's uh, it's nighttime but you can see everything about it and uh, I sent Jarrett some screen caps of those and I, I just I, I love that stuff I was like man that looks so good um, first time watch for me uh it's been built up not just because of you but explicitly because of you sam uh Mm -hmm. this has been built up for me so uh i was i went in with good expectations and uh i was i'm happy to report that uh i i also thought it was a very good show um i think the thing with this too is like uh so you brought up like shock corridor and the other samuel form fuller movies i think when you look at his other movies and then also specifically like film noir stuff from either that era or give or take a decade, like 10 years before, 10 years later, some of the movies that kind of get clumped up in the same genre. uh, I think seeing a a few more of those gives you definitely a better, uh, I don't want to say like appreciation, but like a perspective uh, about these movies in general. And I think that actually helped quite a bit for me watching this movie because I can see little, little things that I think maybe, either get used in other movies or kind of influenced like Jarrett said, fine artisan film craft, (laughs) but uh, the Samuel Fuller stuff uh, definitely like, so naked kiss and um, shock corridor. I remember that's, it's so long ago now, but uh, I remember naked kiss. I think I wanted to like more. I was like, I like everything about it. I just didn't like it that much. And then shock corridor. I had like, I think I had issues at, like on the psychology perspective of it because I was like a hot young like like super stud. I was like I got like eight degrees in psychology. <laughs> I'm so hot. Not even that. I was just like I think they kind of downplayed. Uh, I think they don't get didn't give people enough credit. I was like the fragility of like the human psyche or something. In in terms of comparing Samuel Fuller, I think this thing's like a big step up from those, uh, which is cool. And then in terms of film noir stuff in general, um, I think it's definitely better than, uh, say, some of the Hitchcock films we've watched so far. Uh, like, and those ones too, uh, say like 39 Steps, Lady Vanishes, things like that. Uh, they're good shows, but uh, I think this one does it a little bit better than those ones. So they all kind of come together, right, Jer? Did I say something wrong? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm like, like, well, those aren't really film noirs, RJ. Are they? Are I mean, they I, what I are mean, they? they're Spillers? old. They're they're old. They're old. Um. How would you describe Thirty Nine Steps and Lady Vanishes? Uh, spy, spy thrillers, spy movies. Yeah. 
There's like there's definitely spy elements movie and like film noir are like that's sure. a thin line. It, 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 there is it is splitting hairs. Um, yeah, but yeah, traditionally, like if you were talking like film noir, there's certain like elements to it. Um, yeah, even like because there's like not a lot of like British film noirs but there's like this weird flip because what happens is like because in the 30s they're starting to ramp up but in the 40s you have this thing called world war ii that happens that kind of combines uh like the spy thriller with those the film noir that's going on in america at that very moment with like double indemnity and stuff Mm -hmm. like that like there's like a total like confluence and so that you that like uh the black and white uh and like that sharp cinematography and the lighting and stuff like that it all like there is a there is a, a crossover but uh, sure. I would say that, yeah, those because those movies are like, that's 30s, and this is 53. And actually, the, the, I didn't even remember this until I was just looking. Uh, like, that Naked Kiss and Shock Order, they're like 10 years later than this. They're the, they're the early 60s. Yeah, oh. in, my, in my mind, I always thought that those were, like, before, like, I yeah. I always thought those two were way earlier than yeah. <laughs> Pick Up on South Street. Or I even thought that was earlier Fuller, but it is way later. And mm-hmm. I remember you said you, you didn't like either one of those too much, right, for Naked Kiss or Shock Order. Yeah, I think they're fine. Yeah, I actually felt the same way about Naked Kiss the first time I watched it. But this mm-hmm. most recent watch, I, I'd recommend maybe going back to it, like knowing what mm-hmm. what, what, it, what it's about. You might like it a little bit more. But yeah, Naked Kiss was a lot better than this recent rewatch I gave it. I thought about rewatching them, but then also I thought about the curse that is the Criterion Creeps podcast and watching nothing but Criterion movies once a week. And I was like, no, <laughs> <laughs> fuck them. No, but uh, I, anyway, yeah, I, know, I, 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 I think I love the uh, Daniel Klaus artwork on those uh, Blu-rays more than anything about the movies. Oh, yeah, my, that's my, my favorite. Yeah, those covers are so oh, yeah. great. I, yeah, but and I, I, I do like Shock Corridor and then like Naked Kiss. I also like I think I liked the first time I watched it. I liked it a lot more than rewatching it. I don't know if it was because it was also in the context of the Criterion creep um, and like doing it in that way and framing in those types of movies. I'm like, OK, it's definitely not that type of thing, but. Yeah, I would. I mean, I'll. I own them. I'll rewatch them at some point for sure because uh, they're they're good. Like they're not. Yeah, like I said, this uh, pick up on South Street I think is uh, Sam Fuller's best movie that I've seen. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's been a while since since I've seen White Dog, which I also really like, which is actually a surprisingly great movie for like sometimes uh, old directors. The later, the longer they go, the worse their movies get. Uh, White Dog for a for a movie that's like that late in his career is actually still a pretty uh, effective movie. <laughs> And what's ridiculous with White Dog is how it was like perceived and even picketed or whatever as a racist movie. Which is I was crazy. like, have they not seen Samuel Fuller? Any of his like, pro- he's one of the most progressive like directors, other than like treatment towards women at times in movies. But as far as like other races, anything like that, he was ahead of the game. And the movie itself, I don't know how you can unless somebody just heard like a basic plot. Oh, there's a racist dog, <laughs> and, and just jump to like, oh, he's this is a racist film. Uh, that is one I need to watch again. Though I remember liking it a lot, but I probably yeah. have not seen that in like over ten years, maybe even longer. Yeah, it's yeah. probably like people get their information from synopsises on Letterbox, like busting, where it's like <laughs> about like we we talk about it on this show all the time, where it's like it's either describing a specific scene or it's like just not even not even close to what the movie's about, and it's like that's not accurate at all. So maybe that's what it is. I don't know. Um, Go ahead, RJ. Okay. I, I don't have much left to say. I, the one last thing I was going to say about Shock Corridor, Naked Kiss, we watched that during a Creeptober, and mm. it was a doubleheader. So <laughs> what one big thing about that is, just to put it into context, we might have different opinions if it wasn't that case. <laughs> last thing I'll say, uh, this thing does have like some pretty good gumshoe old old like detective talk stuff things like these are all this one's mixed up a little bit but real quotes he's the big thumb gotta get quick action to save this kitty for big business i was like i don't know what's going on but it sounds cool uh and then the one that you brought up earlier this is the direct quote somebody shot her head off (laughs) there we go and it's like he's like what happened to mo and then it goes somebody shot her head off and you go uh okay uh i thought it was funny but uh no yeah good show uh i liked it it's got some nice little things in there the one scene when he pickpockets the gun off of joey at the, in the subway that's the scene i was talking about earlier he's opening the paper and it's literally touching joey's face and like if that was me i don't know guys i would have been like brah 
what are you doing? You got to get away from me. Like, you're touching my face, man. So uh, I know the sub the subway carts were a little compact and, you know, had a lot of people in there. But uh, anyways, uh, it's good stuff. Real good stuff. How, I also how, liked his beer cooler thing in the water. So Yes. How would you like the term cannon? Cannon? Well, yeah. he's got like a cannon in there? No, when he, uh, I guess that's the term for a pickpocket. Which I, I, I haven't cannon? really seen it. I haven't really seen that's what, who's, like, who's the cannon. That, that's what they kept like when they're interrogating oh, Mo. No. They say fingering the cannon. So I guess that's like the slang for pickpocket, or at least like uh, when they're saying, oh, we need to finger the cannon, or who was the cannon. Uh, mm-hmm. So I, I guess when they were interrogating Mo, that's the term that they kept using, which I haven't, I haven't really heard that in any other movie. Yeah. yeah I don't even know if I noticed that really. It just made sense in the context of what they were talking about. And I was just like, yeah, yeah yes, I understand. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I noticed it the first time I watched it, but like this every single time I watched it, I was like, oh, okay. So that's the term for a pickpocket, I guess, like in the, in those days, at least. I just assume, cause like whenever I talked to Jared, he was always like, I got this cannon in my pants. And I'm always like, all right, man, I don't know what that means. I always assumed it was a gun, but I think it could be something else. <laughs> now that I think about it. Indeed. So do you think it was realistic for Skip to ask for $25,000? He jumped pretty high, right? Because like, first he, I was like, yeah. when I heard five hundred, I'm like, fuck, that's pretty good. And he's like, hey, and uh, you get to keep whatever uh, you're able to, like, cut, uh, get him down to. If, you know, if you, it's like, great, that's good money for her. But then he, mm-hmm. Skip comes back, you're going to have to pay me 25000 <laughs> Yeah, especially and, considering he doesn't even know exactly what it is he has. Exactly. Like he doesn't know. Mm. He doesn't. He, he knows that they want it. He's not really sure how valuable to them it even is. I guess he just assumes he's dealing with like a pretty big syndicate or something that they might have the money to do it. But he assumes for sure. Um, yeah, but. I, I think this movie is like has such like great economy. Like it only has like what ten actors in it, all y'all told, mm-hmm. and, and not uh, many locations. Either. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like there's only like three real locations that they like specifically kind of go back and forth to. Then there's like, like there's Moe's apartment, there's the boathouse, but, and like, even like the layout of the boathouse is like, there's a pier in front of it. And then there's the actual like little like boathouse shack, but then there's like an outside part of it. And like you, you have a totally clear understanding of where everyone is in relationship to one another, which is like something like, I don't know. I appreciate so much nowadays. Um, mm. Like for sometimes like movies like have no sense of place. And this movie is like, okay, we have no location. We have like, yeah, we have a handful of locations. We only have like 10 actors, but let's make it feel like a whole world exists outside of the frame. And it totally feels that way. Um and the other thing that I found really interesting watching it this time too is that uh, Skip and Joey they never meet each other till the very end, like they they've never they're, they're always like kind of mm. circling around one another, uh, and then finally because it's because Joey's a, like doesn't want to get his hands dirty because of the the risks involved, and then when we have the uh, his fellow comrades. Uh, who are like very serious when she's like, yeah, now the cops are saying that it's a communist plot. And then they're like very dour and they're like, oh, because it, it is <laughs> like without saying so. I see the headquarters communist and share is na- an actor named Parley Bear. Parley huh? Bear. Parley Bear. Uh, he played uh, Chester in the original or in the radio version of Gunsmoke. <laughs> There you go. Okay. So yeah, that's the type of that's the type of stuff that peppers this movie is uh, this type of uh, detail and act character actors and people you've never heard of or seen like ever again. Um, yeah. But yeah, like just like yeah, it's so quickly paced, um, and there's not much of a like the story is very like uh, straightforward. I mean, it's like mm-hmm. I need that we need that microfilm back, and now we have to negotiate, and it, there's a lot of back and forth, but it doesn't feel repetitive. Um, it feels like every scene kind of builds on the last and why they have to like find that information. Uh, there's an investigation. It makes sense. Uh, all the character relationships work. Uh, and like you said, um, Sam with like Mo, like the Thelma Ritter character, she's like so well drawn and like, it's usually a character like that is just a toss off. Like she has hopes and mm-hmm. dreams goals. Uh, and it's like, yeah, why, why don't, uh, why don't we see that more? And so like, I think this is also like, uh, I think even in the period, a lot of uh, films didn't have this sort of detail to them uh, or at least didn't have the execution quite right. And uh, I think this is a great example of uh, film noir and one of the better examples I think of the genre. Yeah. And they get, yeah, like you said, they get a lot of mileage out of like basically three locations, like 90% takes like they revisit the police station like three or four times to revisit uh, skip uh, skips like house there like three or four times. Uh, like one of the few scenes that they stray away from out of there uh, was a scene like where he goes to 
like catch the the body like in the coffin like to go to the boat to yep. go make sure he pulls it back which i thought was actually a very good like touching scene that they actually detoured to go to that it didn't seem like it it almost seems out of place a little bit but it, i think it fits it pretty well right mm. yeah, yeah it gives the mo arc a little bit more while also adding to the skip story because like up to that point like skips this like three-time loser who's just got out of jail he's a thief who happens to have stolen like you know a hot ticket and he's like hey i'm gonna cash in and uh but then that's it like it's kind of his thing and like he's always like very antagonistic to every single person who asks him for anything yeah. which is probably co- a common uh criminal trait of uh just you know being uh you know combative on all things but then eventually yeah. he's like well you know mo did all right and it's like well she didn't deserve to get her head blown off and like get dumped on this island she was a person and uh he could he could make a difference and he does that so it's, it's redemption or like a, kind of a bit more of like hey he's not all bad yeah i mm. wonder if they said because um technically uh skip isn't like the he's not a great guy usually in any of these movies in the full noir he would be either dead by the end of it in jail which in this one he's actually yeah, free that's actually really i don't know point. if that was enough redemption for the censors to be like okay that they're gonna allow that as far as like Making me make him be more sympathetic to help out Mo. It's because uh, communism is worse than anything. Yeah. Or I wonder if they felt that because at the end, obviously, you know, they do the the joke, the want to bet, like you're going to be in here quicker than anything, and they probably figured, okay, everyone knows he's what. Give it another two weeks, he'll probably be back in jail either way. Yeah. So you probably just feel like, okay, it's a happy ending per se, but he's not. They're not going to live happily ever after. He's going to be back in jail. He's going to get in trouble again. So they probably took that as, okay, it's not necessarily a happy ending, especially if, you know, given their relationship, which has been kind of physical here and there, uh, as far as, you know, not uh, sexually physical. (laughs) Um, Whoa. Whoa. Hey, did anyone think that uh, that lady was pretty quick to fall in love with Skip? They always are. She meets Mo at the bar and Mo's like, she's in love with you. The dame loves you. Yeah. And then Skip himself is kind of like, huh? He's like, I just met that lady like an hour ago. He caressed, he caressed his cheek, her cheek after punching her. <laughs> you remember? After punching her. That's the big key detail. I guess that's how me and Jarrett met. It's, it's kind of like a Joker Harley Quinn thing, RJ. Oh, it's about the romance you don't see. It's toxic relationships. <laughs> I see. Yeah. I see. Uh, mm. um, the one th- I just watched a few weeks ago, uh, the, the documentary at the atomic, the atomic cafe from 1982, uh, which mm. is like, uh, just like a compilation of, uh, footage from the fifties, uh, around like the cold war. And mm. it's like, so in line with this, like, it's so perfect. Like uh, these movies really don't exaggerate the ridiculousness of, uh, the rhetoric of America and the. The, the move toward like evangelical Christianism and uh, like got to keep freedoms and we got to crush uh, communism no matter what we do. And so this movie just like mm-hmm. from uh, the plot of it is it's like in the simplicity of it. And it works fine for me. Like it's, it's a total piece of pulp. Right. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it definitely reminded me of that, that the 1950s and Oh yeah. Another thing, one of those great little details that I don't know, I thought would be an RJ pickup. But there's a bit where like they're follow like a bunch of the cops they're uh f- they're doing the follow and they're all like mm-hmm. they all have these fedoras on top of their head and they're like peeking over like building ledges <laughs> and you just see these like big mm-hmm. fedoras on top of their heads and I'm like that wouldn't be like my first pick I guess like everyone wore fedoras at, at this period mm-hmm. of time at least in movies but uh, I do wonder. Like, if you're on top of a building, that's just, like, an added little addition to make your being spotted. That Like, hey, somebody's watching me or someone's up there looking down. Well, I think, Jared, the thing is it's called style. Yeah. And if you looked it up sometime, you would understand that uh, it's more important than actually letting, giving yourself up. Oh, folks, if you only knew the shirt that RJ was wearing right now. Okay, Sam, what do you think of this shirt? It could like, use a tie. You could probably uh, get a tie from Mo there. I could get a tie from Mo. I don't know what you'd recommend, buck. like a, like a, like a pinstripe, a stripe, polka dot. I got a bucket hat outside. I could put that on if that works. Yeah. Do you have a cigarette holder too? Your uh, yellow tinted uh, sunglasses. I have everything but the cigarette holder because I I take that shit straight, baby. And those are bananas, right? <laughs> uh, plantains is what I like to say. But uh, I got in trouble for that one time, and someone was like, they didn't like that joke, and they're like, uh-uh, uh-uh. And I was like, I, I was like, all right. 
Did I ever tell that story on there? I don't know. I don't know. Hey, you guys want to hear about who hates this movie? Sure. First up, we have Joyce Chu, one no star. Kidding. I just love it when a woman falls in love with the man that beats her repeatedly. Let's celebrate it. Well, I mean, that does happen, though, in real life, right? Right? Do, do you feel the film celebrates that, though? Mm, I mean, they don't, like, try to steer well, you away from it. I mean, but... he punches her out by accident, but then later on, I think there is a smack in round two. Yeah. Uh, you know... Joyce Chu gave five stars to Joker. Okay. Blade Runner 2049. Five stars. Five stars. Uh, half star films include Fifty Shades Free, Fifty Shades Darker, Fifty Shades of Grey, Dragon Ball Evolution, The Great Wall with Matt Damon, and Godzilla Final Wars. Huh. I mean, that's not a good movie, but like. <laughs> Is that it? I don't know. Okay. Um, I don't know. Andy Gallows, two stars. Mm-hmm. Maybe mm-hmm. it's a classic because at the time it was it was made, it flirted so much with contemporary politics. J. Edgar Hoover himself persuaded them not to characterize the main investigators as FBI by name. I found it kind of dull and confusing. I do find it interesting as an archetypical noir in that every character is simply in it for themselves for their own gain looking out for number one but i thought the story itself lie in the problematic valley between plausible and improbable Mm. that made it at the same time too forced and mundane you know it's a little too forced (laughs) this guy's ratings you did it that's the part that's where you guys laugh (laughs) <laughs> Real big and deep. <laughs> uh, one star films include Steel Magnolias, uh, Driving Miss Daisy, also one star, Fanny and Alexander, Failsafe, The Taking of Pelham 123 from 1974, Jarrett. That taking of Pelham. Five star films are things like The Warriors, uh, Into the Woods. I don't know how that is. Broadcast News. <laughs> When Harry met Sally, Harold and Maude, Roma, whatever. Person that actually doesn't have a lot of rated films. This might be a new account. Okay. Oh, and the, oh. One, I, the one I missed here is a one and a half star from Benji. Ravioli, ravioli, give me the formuloli. SpongeBob reference? <laughs> is it, oh, is that? I think it is. You're probably, you're, oh. I mean, that sounds uh, possible. I, I think I remember Mr. Crab saying that mm. or something. That makes sense. This person also gave Blade Runner 2049 five stars. Uh, Benji's avatar is a picture of a llama wearing a hat. Uh, and it says they are from Western Canada, Jarrett. Uh-oh. So uh, favorite films are Mishima, Lahane, uh, Criterion movies, uh, The Favorite, and City of God. So those aren't bad movies. Nope. Not any of them. Five stars to Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Just because I know that'll make Frank sad. <laughs> Half star films. Uh, the Love Guru. Junior with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Come on. What else we got in here? Birth of a Nation. Mortal Kombat Annihilation. Not a half star. Uh, Joe Dirt. Come on. That's a good show. Uh, what else we got in here, Jarrett? Master of Disguise, your favorite film. Holes, a good movie. Uh, the Room, Chicken Little. I don't know. Like, their half-star ratings are kind of all over the place. He also five-starred uh, Blade Runner 2049, which I know is a favorite of yours. Yep. Yeah, and, like, that's what one of those other guys like, too. It's, like, I don't know. You see these trends that pop up all the time sam it's like i don't do it intentionally it's just like you see they all like the same stuff they all love blade runner they all love portrait of a woman in fire everybody loves call me by your name i don't know i don't get it you see what i have to work with here (laughs) well any last thoughts here on pickup uh what do you think sam any lingering ideas uh, no, I think we pretty much covered everything. Um, it's yeah, like I said, kind of sum it up. It's my favorite film noir. Um, it's one of my favorite movies of all time, and it's one I probably will revisit. I, I pretty much yearly, I'd say. 
Nice. Because uh, I watched it f- well five times in the last eight years, so a little bit less than yearly, but which mm-hmm. that's a lot for me. My last question would be: Is if you were a pickpocket in like 1950, what would your name be? <laughs> Instead of Skip, Skip McCoy. I don't know. Yeah, Skip is pretty good. I don't know if I could beat that. I'd be Pepperoni Slim. <laughs> what would and your the, style be? Would you do it from the front, back, overhand, underhand? Uh, you got to buy me dinner first, friend, <laughs> before I can let you in on that information. And since no one asked, Fats Duncan. <laughs> I think Fat Slim would be good, too. I could be Pepperoni Slim and you could be Fat Slim. We're brothers? Yeah, it were, is is that actually is that from something fat slim, or am I just making that up? Like fat boy slim. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I guess. Okay, so if you're fat slim, I'm pepperoni slim. Sam, you could maybe be the starting line of the 1962 Dodgers. <laughs> All of them. All of them. All of them. Yeah. I'll accept that. After the break, RJ gets his face shot off. Got your head shot off, man. 